Hello and welcome everyone to this tutorial on conceptual anesthesia. My name is Dr. Janvi and I have here with me Dr. Saurabh. Hello sir. Today we are going to be showing you different methods of securing the airway in a patient. Now why is it important to learn this? As anesthetists, we have to make sure that throughout the procedure of the surgery, our patient should not become hypoxic at any time. So, we use different devices like endotracheal tubes, supraglottic airway devices and oro and nasopharyngeal airways that ventilate and oxygenate our patient. Now, this is not important just in the operation theater but also in the intensive care unit. So, it becomes absolutely necessary for you to know how to secure the airway with all the devices that we have here today. So, let us have a look at them. So, we are going to start with the situation in the operation theater. Now, this is our patient who is posted for an abdominal surgery. I have given him IV anesthetic agents. So, I have induced him with fentanyl 2 mics per kg as an opioid, IV induction agent propofol 2 mg per kg and muscle relaxant has been given. Here, since I am not anticipating a difficult airway in him, I have given raw curonium to this patient for muscle paralysis. So, now I am going ahead with the intubation and sir will teach us the steps of an ideal intubation. So, as you can see, the first and the foremost thing is to give correct position to the patient. The ideal position is to give head extension and this head extension is given at the Atlanto occipital joint. This position is also commonly called as sniffing the morning air position. Now, the next thing I have to do is open the mouth of the patient. So, the mouth is open. Now, I take the laryngoscope. I check the light of the laryngoscope. This has to be done prior to starting the operation. Now, I introduce the laryngoscope from the right corner of my mouth. Remember, the laryngoscope always has to be held in the left hand, irrespective of whether you are left-handed or right-handed. Once the laryngoscope is introduced in the right corner of the mouth, we sweep it to the left to take the tongue to one side. Now, once the tongue has been taken to one side, the next thing that I do is I give a lifting action. As you can see, the lifting is such that you don't lever onto the front teeth of the patient, otherwise it can cause the teeth to get damaged and break. Once the lifting action is done, the next thing is I will take my endotracheal tube and hold the endotracheal tube between the this part, this is one third and this is two third, okay. So, distal two third and proximal one third. So, this is the ideal position to hold the endotracheal tube so that the curve is maintained and this curve helps us to put the endotracheal tube directly into the glottic opening. So, now we can see that the tube is going into the vocal cords. Once the tube has been inserted inside, we remove the laryngoscope and we inflate the cuff of the endotracheal tube. Remember not to over inflate, the cuff pressure should be less than 20 centimeter of water. So, just 2 to 3 ml of air will be enough and then we will ventilate using the ambu bag. If you are in the OT, you can even connect the circuit and ventilate from the circuit. Once you check the inflation of the lungs and you auscultate for air entry to be bilaterally equal and you can see capnograph on the monitor that is when we confirm our endotracheal intubation. Make sure that you see at least 6 capnographs and they should be ideal that is between 35 to 45 mm of Hg so that you can confirm that this is your ideal endotracheal intubation. So, this is the procedure of endotracheal intubation. Now, suppose I was not able to intubate in the first attempt, then we have a maximum of 4 attempts that we can take. In these 4 attempts, we will try to use adjuncts like steelet, bougie, different size tubes and different types of laryngoscope like McCoy or video laryngoscope. But you have to limit the number of attempts to 4. Why? Because if you are not able to intubate this patient and it is an unanticipated difficult airway, we quickly need to move on to the next step so that the patient does not become hypoxic. So, our next step will be to insert a supraglottic airway device to maintain ventilation and oxygenation in the patient. So, here we have the yeah. ProSeal supraglottic airway device 
this is the ideal device to be inserted because it forms a good sealing pressure with the larynx and it also has less chances of aspiration. It is a second generation LMA. So, we will be inserting the Ambu LMA in this patient. Now, let us have a look at how to hold the LMA while insertion. So, you can see sir is placing his index finger right at the junction of the cuff and the airway tube. Now, important thing is you need to deflate the cuff completely before introducing it and make sure that it is completely flattened out. The LMA has to be chosen as per the weight of the patient. So, we have different sizes LMA which we have already covered in our special chapter on supraglottic airway devices. So, now we can insert the supraglottic airway device. Again, open the mouth and flatten the cuff against the heart palate and then introduce it. You can push the LMA inside. Once the LMA is inside, we connect it to the ventilator or to the Ambu bag. But before doing that, you have to inflate the cuff of the LMA as per the recommended inflation volume as per the size of the LMA. Now, so we are inflating the LMA, yes, and then ventilating the patient. Okay. Now, suppose we are not able to put in the LMA at the first attempt also, then I have a chance of three attempts to put the supraglottic airway device or the laryngeal mask airway. Okay. Now, if in three attempts also the supraglottic airway device is not going in, then the next thing I do to maintain oxygenation to my patient is I mask ventilate this patient. So, we will show you the ideal technique of holding a mask on the patient's face. The first technique is called as the C and E technique in which you create a C around the mask and the E around the angle of the jaw and you give a chin lift. Can you see? With these three fingers, we are giving a chin lift to open up the airway. Then, if you are not able to ventilate using the C and E technique, the next thing we can use is a jaw thrust. So, in the jaw thrust, we put the fingers on the angle of the mandible and we pull it up and we hold the mask down with these two fingers to maintain the seal. If this is also not possible, we use a two person technique in which the mask is held by one person and the ventilation is done by the other person. So, this will give one person the liberty to put all his strength on to holding the mask properly. Now, if mask ventilation is initially not possible, we can use adjuncts like oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal airway. So, here we have the Giddles oropharyngeal airway. We will show you how to gauge what is the correct size of oropharyngeal airway to be used in the patient. So, place the flange of the airway at the angle of the mouth and place the tip of the airway at the tragus of the ear. So, the ideal way to gauge the size of an oropharyngeal airway is the flange should be at the angle of the mouth and the tip should be at the angle of the mandible. If this fits properly, this means it is the ideal oropharyngeal airway. Now, we will introduce the oropharyngeal airway. There are two techniques to do this. First, you put the airway and then rotate it and then push it inside. Yes. And then we ventilate the patient. So, as you can see from the side, this is where the oropharyngeal airway has opened up the space between the base of the tongue and the posterior pharynx. This maintains the patency of the airway and helps in ventilating the patient. The other technique of introducing the oropharyngeal airway is directly inside as per the curve of the OPA. So, these are the two techniques. Now, if your patient has less mouth opening and there isn't space to put an oropharyngeal airway or if there is trauma of the mandible, we can use a nasopharyngeal airway instead. So, this is an, a nasopharyngeal airway with an adjustable flange. To measure the size of the nasopharyngeal airway to be used in this patient, the first thing we do is that we place the tip of the airway at the tragus of the ear and we place the flange at the tip of the nose, okay, so next to the nares. 
Now we can adjust this flange accordingly to what will be the correct size. So this flange is adjustable. Then we put uh, water soluble jelly into the patient's nasal cavity and we introduce the nasopharyngeal airway with the bevel turned towards the nasal septum. Make sure that you don't force it. The direction in which you put the nasopharyngeal airway is straight down and then a slight curve. That is the direction of the floor of the nose. So, you can see from the side that the nasopharyngeal airway has opened up the space between the nasopharynx and the posterior part of the nasal cavity. So, when a person becomes unconscious, the most common structure to obstruct the airway is the base of the tongue. So, when the base of tongue touches the posterior pharyngeal wall, the airway closes. So, both of these gadgets, the oropharyngeal airway as well as the nasopharyngeal airway, help us open the airway. And where we have to use them is individualized. So, if a person is unconscious but has a gag reflex, we will use the nasopharyngeal airway. But if he is unconscious and he does not have a gag reflex, we can use the oropharyngeal airway. So, this oropharyngeal airway can be used for three things. Firstly, to open the airway. Secondly, it's a route to do suctioning. And thirdly, it can also function as a bite block. So, whereas the nasopharyngeal airway, it can only act as a suction mechanism as well as opening the airway. So, if a person has less mouth opening as Dr. Janvi told, we can actually use a nasopharyngeal airway. But we have to realize that in a person having a base of skull fracture, we should avoid the nasopharyngeal airway. Now, once we have introduced the airways, but if we are still unable to mask ventilate the patient and the patient is rapidly desaturating at this point, the only step that we have left is to do an emergency front of neck access. So, in the emergency front of neck access, we can do either a cricothyroidotomy or a tracheostomy. Tracheostomy, there are two ways to do it. Either you can do a surgical tracheostomy or a percutaneous tracheostomy. Percutaneous tracheostomy requires skill and is mostly done as an elective procedure. So, it is not recommended in emergency. We will show you how to do the emergency cricothyroidotomy in this patient. First, we will show how to palpate for the landmarks. So, the most prominent part in the front of the neck is the thyroid cartilage. So, as you can see over here, the thyroid cartilage and you can feel the front. And then we have the cricoid cartilage, which is a ring shaped cartilage below it. So, we palpate for both the thyroid and cricoid cartilage and in between them, there is a depression that you can feel. This depression is covered by a membrane which is called as the cricothyroid membrane and this is through which we can access the emergency airway in a patient. So, we take either the cricothyroidotomy set or if you do not have that, we take a wide bore IV cannula which is 14 gauge and then we introduce it into the cricothyroid membrane and then we can ventilate through it using a high frequency jet ventilation. Remember, this is just a temporary airway, it can get displaced. So, you need to call the surgeon and have a permanent access in the form of tracheostomy once your patient is stable. So, that is how we carry out securing the airway. So, we have discussed how to do endotracheal intubation, mask ventilation, supraglottic airway device insertion, oro and nasopharyngeal airway insertion and the front of neck access. Thank you.